The Veteran Narrative, Thought Leadership at the Intersection of Veterans and Social Innovation, with Army Blackhawk pilot Chris Marvin, Principal at Marvin Strategies, on Episode 145 of Veteran on the Move. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. If you're a veteran in transition, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. And now, your host, Joe Crane. The top seven paths to freedom is my free gift to you for listening to the show, featuring seven great ways for a veteran to take their first step into the exciting world of entrepreneurship. To receive your free gift, go to VeteranOnTheMove.com, or if you're listening on a mobile device, you can text the word VETERAN to 38470. Chris Marvin is a principal for Marvin Strategies, a strategy and communications consulting practice that specializes in social innovation, civic engagement, defense policy, and the veteran narrative. He is a founder and former executive director of Got Your Six, a nonprofit campaign that advocated for accurate portrayals of veterans in film, television, and popular media. He served for seven years as U.S. Army officer and Black Hawk helicopter pilot and is a combat wounded veteran of the war in Afghanistan. He holds a bachelor's from the University of Notre Dame and an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. All right, Chris Marvin, welcome to Veteran on the Move. And before we get to talking about business and entrepreneurship, like we always do, take us back a little ways and tell us what you did in the Army. Yeah, well, thanks for having me today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, well, I uh, my story is that I spent a little less than eight years in the Army. Uh, I was an active duty officer and uh, a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. I was uh, stationed primarily in Hawaii at Schofield Barracks and Wheeler Army Airfield with the 25th Infantry Division. And in 2004, excuse me, 2004, I deployed to Afghanistan as a platoon leader. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, after about four months and about 40 combat missions, I was severely wounded uh, in a helicopter crash near the Af- Afghan-Pakistan border. Um, and that sort of ended my aviation career, uh, but I would end up being in the military for another four plus years. Uh, had a really long recovery, um, lots of physical therapy and surgeries and things. Um, and it really, of course, shaped my military career since it, it covered about half of it. Um, and, and gave me some perspective going into uh, the civilian world. Getting out in January 2009, I was medically retired. Um, and that's, that's, that's a brief history of what I did in the military. All right. Well, thanks for your service. Uh, uh, you know, we do share sh- something in common. We were both helicopter pilots. Um, sorry to hear about your crash. I'm uh, uh, you know, glad that, that you survived. And uh, I suppose... Talking about that whole thing could be the subject of a, of a whole other podcast interview. Um, <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. So talk to us about what happened as you were being medically retired. What was your transition like at coming out of the Army? Yeah, well, first, I, yeah, I want to point out it's always good to talk to another helicopter pilot. I, I like to tell um, you know other, other folks and especially fixed-wing guys that you never really trust an aircraft that can't fly backwards. So you and I know that. <laughs> and have that in common. That's great. Um, I love that. Uh, but uh, – but, but yeah, so, so, so my helicopter crash happened in, in, in August 2004, and, and, and I broke um, my foot, both of my legs, my arm, my face, did damage to both knees, both hips, both shoulders. And, and like you said, it, it could probably take, take a whole podcast itself to kind of to walk through all of the details and the things that happened during my recovery. Uh, the long story short is that the recovery was about four years, 10 major surgeries, thousands of hours of physical therapy, and, um, and that gave me sort of a, a runway, if you will, into... The, my transition, right? I, I knew for a significant period of time that I was uh, terminal in the military, and that my my career was 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 ending or over. Um, the reason I stayed for so long, obviously, was the the, in the sort of the medical treatment that dragged on. My my right leg was broken for two and a half years, um, and and had to have multiple surgeries to 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 make sure it got fixed. And and one of my mottos was that the army broke me. So the army's going to fix me, um, and that worked really well. And it also gave me that time to kind of uh, get my head around what I was going to do next. Um, one of the things, probably in the last year to two years that I was in, that I that I really really was looking into was some sort of advanced education. So you know, I'd been in ROTC uh, commission. I went to the University of Notre Dame and and, and graduated 
uh, and had headed straight to flight school. And so um, I had my undergraduate, but I thought, you know, a, a graduate degree might be might be important as well to add on to sort of some of the credentials I had, especially especially because I had an accounting degree in college, and then I went and flew helicopters <laughs> for a few years, and so I wasn't using those accounting skills. And so it was time to sort of get a refresh and try to uh, see what other skills and opportunities I could I could put in play. And so I ended up uh, working with the local VA while I was still on active duty, talking to the VA uh, about vocational rehab, because it was pretty obvious that I was going to have a high enough VA disability rating to qualify for voc rehab. Uh, and, and, you know, the GI Bill would have been great too, but voc rehab was just slightly better, especially because I could make a convincing argument that I had an accounting degree that wasn't worth very much because I hadn't used it and didn't really know what I was doing anymore. I couldn't fly helicopters anymore. And so I needed more or less a new vocation. Uh, and Voc Rehab was able to uh, subsidize my uh, my entry into an MBA program. Um, I worked really hard while I was still transitioning out, while I was still in active duty, uh, to to sort of preempt some of the things like my VA rating, because you have to have uh, a high enough VA rating to qualify for Voc Rehab. Um, of course, most people don't get their VA rating until they've taken the uniform off and separated. But I was able to to work with them to to sort of get a um, uh, a temporary rating or a, or a predictive rating uh, that wasn't official until I got out, but allowed them to start processing some of my voc rehab paperwork and processes, you know, so that I could have a smooth transition. And you get, you got to apply for these business schools in the fall so that you can go back the next fall. So I had a whole year of prepping for this and taking GMAT courses and uh, taking the GMAT and um, filling out applications and those fees and everything and, and having that uh, VA support even when I was still in active duty and then and then I got out that January. So from January to the fall, I was uh, getting ready to make the move and go back to school. So that, that, was, uh, that was an important part of the time and the transition that I had that I recognize most people don't have, but also uh, I feel like I was making the most out of what I did have there. Yeah, you know, I was uh, elk hunting with some fellow Marines a few weeks ago, and we were all telling our different VA stories. And you know, some guys with hardly any anything seemingly wrong with them, they end up with fifty, sixty percent disability. And then there's other guys that have serious issues that are even visible and obvious. And you know, some guy, I mean. You hear some guys they're like you know they're missing a hand or, or an arm and they and they get right. fifty or sixty percent and then you got other guys that look perfectly normal and they've even got more than that and uh, I know one of the guys I was with had he'd fought with him for like ten years to finally get his fifty percent that he was due um, so you hear all the different stories uh, with all yeah. that so um, it definitely is um, I think the more work you put into it in the beginning you know the, the better. It, and the more willing of a, the more willing you are to put up a fight, um, the the better off it may end up coming. But sometimes it seems totally random what some guys get and what some guys don't get. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a tough debate. You know, my 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 dad did thirty six years uh, active duty, a lot in the na- or some active duty and a lot in the National Guard, um, full time National Guard most of my life in the state of Illinois, and and of course he he never went for VA benefits, you know, and and here's a guy who who literally can't hear. 50% of what we're saying because he flew helicopters in Vietnam back in the day before, you know, I guess they had good hearing protection. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's that, Hey dad, Hey dad, Hey dad. And he, he was, he was really stubborn. He didn't want to, you know, feel like he was taking too much from the government. My mom finally convinced him that, you know, he could get, we, she could kill two birds with one stone. She could get him involved with the VA and get him some hearing aids so that she, so he could start listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he, that's Maybe that was he part of his of, secret plan. <laughs> that's right. No, but that's that's what got him involved uh, with with VA, and he still doesn't do much. But but it got him into the system, um, and and it's one of those things. It's a tough thing. I I actually feel like I'm kind of lucky because I didn't really have a decision to make. I was, you know, if you will, broken enough that it was pretty obvious that I was going to have a VA rating and a high VA rating um, because there was just so much that I was walked so many disabilities I was walking out of the military with that I didn't walk in the, into the military with. And, and that that's sort of what VA is, is thinking about. And, and I, you know, I have some issues with the system too, but I do really feel like the voc rehab program, when done right, because it's not just for school, right? It's also uh, to, to help people start businesses sometimes. I, I remember talking to the head of voc rehab 
uh, out here in Hawaii. And uh, he said another guy he just finished processing, they helped him buy a pig farm. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a pig farmer um, somewhere, I think, on the big island of Hawaii. And, and they helped him, you know, put help and get a down payment on the, <clears throat> excuse me. Really? Get a down payment on the loan or something. And, uh, and, and I think that's interesting too, because, you know, they, they, when it's done right, and of course we know it's not always done right, but when vocational rehab is done correctly, that's precisely what it is. It's, it's helping you find that new vocation, uh, specifically because you're not able to take, you know, sort of have success with the, vac- the vocation that you, uh, learned in the military. So, um, you know, that's one of the great programs, I think. Right. So, so you end up in the, in the, in the Wharton School of Business at University of Pennsylvania? That's correct. I moved my family from, uh, Honolulu to Philadelphia. Uh, I can't say that they were happy about that at the time, but no, actually <laughs> Philly's a great town. We love being in Philly and we, we were there for actually seven years. Um, and Wharton, uh, is a great school, um, has a pretty good veteran contingent in in the MBA program and the full time program anyway, which is the one that I was in. Um, and I was part of the veteran club there and got to talk to lots of folks who had different experiences and really just 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 top tier uh, men and women who who mostly had served you know in combat and had you know had some really interesting specialties. You know, you had SEALs, you had submar- submariners, uh, a lot of aviators actually, um, other special forces folks. Um, and, and it was, uh, a, a good group to be a part of, um, and a really good education for me because, um, I felt that both my, my experience in sort of jumping into this, this business world that I hadn't had not experienced at all. I mean, I, I took business classes as an undergrad, but that doesn't really count. And I'd been flying helicopters and recovering from injuries. That's, that's basically had been my career up to this point. Um, uh, I'm 30 years old when I start at at uh, at Wharton I'm older than most of them and and but they have this experience you know on Wall Street or in a private equity firm somewhere or or, or doing marketing for a big uh you know consumer product company and 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 I'm learning from them and at the same time I feel like most folks in that environment at least and I, I know that I don't speak for all schools but in this environment they were really really interested in what we were doing what we had been doing as veterans um what we'd done in the military, what we were going to do next. And, and there were some really interesting conversations uh, in and out of classrooms that, that happened just because people were really open to those conversations. I thought that was really healthy and a good environment in both directions. Yeah. So what started happening once you were in business school and coming out? Um, did, did you end up getting a J-O-B or did you go right into the <laughs> entrepreneurship thing? Yeah. No. Well, I mean, the answer is kind of both. Um, and it was a struggle for me too. Like, I kept looking, so, so so as 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 pleasant as I was about sort of hey opening my eyes to the business world, I also had some cynicism about it too. I think that that like many people who serve in the military, you you have this 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 feeling of being something bigger than yourself. Um, and then in my experience was actually when I was getting out of the military, the last few years actually that I was in, um, I was I I didn't have a real full-time job in the in the military either it's hard to i had so much physical therapy and surgeries that i had to they didn't have a good position for me you know a captain who's available three days a week because the rest of the time he's at the hospital um there wasn't exactly a, a you know uh i wasn't gonna actually fill a role in, in an s3 shop somewhere so they had a hard time placing me i ultimately told them uh, the, the, the commander, the powers that be in the military that, that I wanted to volunteer for this nonprofit called the mission continues. Um, and so this is even before I get out, before I go to Wharton, I was working for this young startup nonprofit called the mission continues, which is helping other veterans volunteer in their communities. And I was involved from the very beginning. It's now a really huge organization that I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard of. Um, oh yeah. And you know, um, this episode won't release until December, but uh, we're actually talking the day after the election, and the founder of Mission Continues, Eric Greitens, yep. Navy SEAL, is now the governor of Missouri. That's right. He That's won. right. Yeah, yeah. Eric, Eric won yesterday, and uh, and uh, uh, we're all real proud of him. And um, yeah, so I was working with Eric early on. Uh, Eric and a guy named uh, Ken Harbach co-founded Mission Continues, and, and Ken actually works for Team Rubicon. 
Um, yeah, and like Ken, Ken's the reason that you and I are talking right now, by the way. That, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yep. Met him um, down at the always, USA conference. I mean, these are these are where some of the best connections come from, right? We we Absolutely. find as veterans, you know, some other folks, and and they start sort of connecting you to, to people who are like minded and 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 have interesting things to say and share. Um, so for me, being involved at the very beginning of the mission continues. That was entrepreneurial in and of itself. In fact, um, I was for a while I was awarded a fellowship, and my fellowship was just supposed to be volunteering back for the mission continues to help them start the program. So it was like it was not much more than an idea um, and a check checking account with a very, very low balance. <laughs> it's kind of what they had at that point. Uh-huh. Um, but we were out there looking for veterans who wanted to volunteer in their communities. And so there's this aspect of, of, of um, service, right? Service to the community that, that really paralleled what I had done in the military and that being part of something bigger than yourself and having this sense of purpose. That was, that really resonated for me, especially as someone who'd been wounded and kind of, you know, therefore kind of like missing direction. Um, and you hear the same thing from many, many Mission Continues fellows and Mission Continues uh, volunteers, people who are in the, the platoons all across the country. Um, and then so going into business school, I thought, well, I want to take, you know, that, 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 ex- that f- fulfilling experience I had in the military combined with the importance of, of having an impact in my community, which I found in the Mission Continues, and then add to it some of these skills, these business skills, you know, the, the, the accounting and the finance, the marketing and the management skills that, that I could, so what, what could I do with that? Um, I looked a lot at, uh, actually like renewable energy, um, and, and others, other things like that that might give me that, that sense of fulfillment as well, but, but also use my business skills. Um, ultimately as I was preparing for graduation and I, and I knew I needed a job, I, I, I started looking at, uh, like at consulting. Um, which I don't know how many of your listeners have, have been through that two year business school experience, but if you start looking at consulting in your fourth of four semesters, uh, that's not a good idea. You should have started looking at it in your first of four semesters <laughs> and <laughs> gone through the entire process and the interview and the summer internship and then back through more interviews and you either get a job or you don't get a job or you look somewhere else. And here I was, you know, 75 or more percent done with, with my MBA. And I was like, Oh, maybe I could do that consulting thing. Um, and then I also got an opportunity from a from a nonprofit. Um, there was a guy that I had met. Uh, I had 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 helped him write an op ed uh, that had to do with veterans and being involved in service, and and sort of just knew this guy because of uh, the mission continues and my involvement there. And he worked for a nonprofit called Service Nation, which is also focused on um, community and national service, and. He ran their veteran portfolio and was going to move on to a new job. And so I talked to him about replacing him in, in, in his job, uh, sort of a civilian rip, I guess. And, uh, and ultimately, that's what I ended up doing. I, I, did, I had an offer from a, from a solar services company to do sort of solar stuff. So that's my energy thing. I had two of the big three consulting firms. Um, the only two that I interviewed with had, uh, had given me offers to stay in Philadelphia. And then I had this nonprofit offer. Um, and I took that one. And then the interesting thing was, as I took that job and I was taking over the military portfolio at Service Nation, um, I started to see more and more opportunity. Um, and I guess looking back on it, I probably didn't, probably didn't think this at the time, but it was probably an, an opportunity to be entrepreneurial, um, sort of in place in, in an existing 501c3, but to be entrepreneurial. And so we took the relationships that existed um, in this military portfolio, um, and we turned everything on its head and started a brand new program called Got Your Six. Um, and the intention of Got Your Six was to um, leverage some of the relationships we had, specifically in Hollywood, um, as well as with uh, some some you know some folks in the federal government, um, and help to change the narrative about veterans. And so what we had seen was that that veterans are often portrayed, you know, as 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 broken or 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 um, uh, charity cases, if you will, some uh, victims of something. Right. Um, and we found that we, of course, knew, we being a handful of folks who were veterans or had close relationships with veterans, and we knew that that wasn't true across the board and probably not true statistically uh, across the entire veteran population. And, and so how do we change that narrative? And, and so um, for the next few years, I'd be working with Hollywood to, to build that program, uh, to bring a bunch of nonprofits on board to support it, to raise a bunch of money and give that to nonprofits and to sort of have an impact 
that that was using my business skills um, certainly those entrepreneurial skills that I learned and then and then uh, still doing something really good with them. Wow, that's awesome! And so you took yourself eventually. You took yourself out of out of the nonprofit. And, and started the venture you're involved in now, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, I spent four years at Got Your Six uh, building the program, expanding the program, um, like I said, making great relationships, and uh, and then was able to really take a lot of those relationships, uh, a lot of what I had learned uh, at that nonprofit, and start my own thing. Um, I have a consulting practice. It's called Marvin Strategies, and you can make make fun of me for the lack of originality of the name, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 eponymous, and it describes what I do. It's it's me, and there's some strategy involved. Um, but <laughs> but what uh, what what really motivated me to do that was that I actually started seeing that there were places that I could actually have real impact in a more effective way through the private sector than I could have through the nonprofit sector. And one example um, uh, was, you know, working with a a television network uh, that was a partner of Got Your Six. And and we had partnerships with every major studio network and agency in Hollywood. And and some were closer than others. And one of them that we were real close to and did a lot of work with said, Hey, we really want you to look at um, this new movie that's coming out because it has a, a veteran character in it and, and we're worried that the character you know doesn't really portray veterans very well and so yeah no problem happy to watch a movie and doing it for a for a donor and a supporter of our nonprofit great hour and a half you watch the movie you write a little feedback fantastic and then they came back and said well now we'd like you to read these scripts because we have this new uh, television series coming out and it's got some veteran characters in it and we want you to read through all of these scripts and all of a sudden I started looking and saying well now you're talking about like an eight episode series, which is a short series, but it's still every script takes, you know, if you're going to read it in detail, it takes 45 minutes or an hour to read maybe because an hour long show um, and, and you're going to mark it up and then you got to write up all the notes. And I'm like, now you're asking me for like eight to 12 hours of work. Um, that seems like a lot. And then they're saying, oh, then and now we want you to advise on this other thing we're doing. And now I want you to do this. And I started to think um, I can do this stuff at a nonprofit, but I also but, but but I'm not getting sort of the, the revenue model right here because they're not donating for me to do this stuff. They're just doing it because they know that we have I have the knowledge. Um, and they're not really asking the nonprofit to do it as much as they're asking me to do it. And I realized that I had to say no to them. I had to say, no, I can't, I can't help with this because I'm busy. I have a staff. I have a mission. I have fundraising to attend to. I have other partnerships to broker. I have events to plan. Like I just, I want to do this stuff. I don't have time for it. Um, and and somebody who was really smart, another veteran, um, uh, a guy, actually, a friend of mine who'd actually uh, been a congressman for a while, said to me, um, you know, hey, you've done a lot of good things with Got Your Six, and the mission continues, and all that stuff's going to keep, it's going to still be out there. He goes, but if you can go find another way to make an impact uh, that makes you happy, you know, then you, you're adding to everything you've accomplished. So I thought I needed to stay at Got Your Six because it was you know, my baby and it was really important to me and, and, you know, how could it ever, you know, continue to exist without me? And, and he helped me realize that that's going to stay there. Someone else will take over and it's going to, it's going to do great things. And you've always got that. You started that fire and that fire will keep burning and you can go start another fire. Um, and for me, the ability to do something in the private sector where I could watch those movies and read those scripts um, and then start to expand other services that I could provide to folks based on my expertise um, really gave me uh, a feeling that I, ah, I'm, I'm having a big impact, an impact that I actually couldn't do in the nonprofit sector that this private sector opportunity uh, offers me. And 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 I'll tell you what, I, I I love doing that, but I love more than anything, I love I love doing it alone and having the freedom of of being an entrepreneur. And and um, one of the first things I told people, they said, "What kind of clients are you looking for?" I said, "People who are doing interesting things that I like working with." Period. <laughs> End of story. That's awesome. Right? Yeah. Doesn't have to do with the money. I want to be involved in interesting things and I like people that I like to work with. That's Yeah. You can no, I mean, do that. That, that, that's it's totally true. And 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 for me, I mean, I know that there's a lot of ent- entrepreneurs out there that 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 are, you know, they're 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 thinking about their exit strategy, they're looking for, you know, the big payday or, you know, investors that can bring in the right amount. And that that's important. Um and growth is important. 
for me, you know, as long as I can make this sustainable and sustainable means that, you know, I can feed my family and pay the mortgage and, um, you know, do the things I want to do in life. And, and that, that's, that's enough for me. Um, and then, then I'm really looking for, you know, people, people I want to work with and, uh, and, and projects I want to work on. I, I don't do them for free, but, but I, I certainly can have some leeway. Um, because I don't also, I, I've chosen to stay really slim on this. I've, I've had opportunities to, to expand, to maybe bring on an employer to, um, and, and I've kind of told people that, you know, I, I work from my home office. I have, uh, a laptop and a really nice, um, sort of briefcase bag that my wife got me when I graduated from, from business school. And, and, and that's my whole company right there. <laughs> me, that laptop and that briefcase. And, and I'm happy to keep it there, um, because of the freedom it gives me. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking at your website, Mar- uh, marvinstrategies.com, and you know, it says the veteran narrative, thought leadership, right. you know, thought leadership at the intersection of veterans and social innovation. I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. But I'm like, I wonder what that really means. <laughs> what does it mean? So a lot of what you're doing, I mean, it started off with editing movie scripts and giving feedback for TV shows and, and stuff like that. Um, but it's kind of grown out from there. Uh, uh, I would imagine at least to some point, is it primarily dealing with um, movie scripts and TV shows, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the first part of it. That's the building blocks. And, and that's how, like I explained how, what got me inspired to, to start Marvin strategies. Uh, and, and knowing that I had a client or two in the entertainment industry that, that I could advise on those types of things. And, and those are great projects when they come along. I actually just finished reading, uh, a couple scripts from a couple different networks um, on on programs that are coming out soon, and then uh, for one of them, I got to then watch. Uh, now it's on air, so I've gotten to watch it, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, I, I expanded more because a lot of what we did at Got Your Shicks wasn't just the content stuff; it was everything that surrounds that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it was. It's really a broader question of how do you think about and talk about veterans. Now that can be for a, a screenwriter. Um, but that can also be for, you know, an HR professional at a, at a big corporation. Um, and, and so you, you look at a big company and, and how they think and talk about veterans is important. Um, and one of the main things that, that I bring to them and that sort of follows the, the uh, construct that we created at Got Your Six is that, is that these veterans are their assets, right? And so there's, there's a lot of data that we were able to dig up, dig up on this and put together at Got Your Six and, you know, veterans and how, how healthy they are civically how much they vote and volunteer and things like that. And, you know, the fact that, you know, veterans are more employed than civilians actually really always have been. Um, for another podcast, we can talk about the, the myth of the veteran unemployment crisis. Uh, never happened. Um, veterans are always more employed than civilians. Um, and they make more money at their jobs. They stay longer and they uh, get promoted faster. And so getting that type of message to a big corporation can completely change the way that they think about veterans in their hiring process. It goes from thinking about veterans as a, as a group that they should hire because it's the right thing to do. And, and they can start thinking about veterans as, as a group that they need to hire because it's going to help, you know, their company succeed. It's going to help their bottom lines help make more money. And, and from an economic standpoint, that's really what they should be looking at. And so I work with corporations, not just to sort of have that revelation but to then embed that into their company culture. Because what really happens is you get a CEO that buys into that argument, like, oh, wow, yeah, veterans are great. I see the data, um, and, and we, we, we want them to be part of this company, you know, not, not because we're patriotic, but because they will help us be more successful. Um, but then that doesn't necessarily trickle down. Um, and if it doesn't trickle down to the hiring managers and the HR professionals of the company, then, you know, they're not going to execute on, on this CEO vision. And so... Uh, it, it's long and it's complicated and there's, you know, like a five-step program and all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's kind of what, what, uh, Marvin strategies does for, for, for corporations. And then, and then the social, social innovation part is a whole nother thing. I mean, I look at it and say, look, I ran a nonprofit that wanted to change the narrative. And so, um, we, we understand the narrative part, um, both in Hollywood and in, in a corporation and, and anywhere else that, that a narrative might need to be created but we also in order to be successful had to have a really unique social innovation strategy that that is applicable to our veteran work but is also applicable to other um other aspects of work as well um really any issue you wanted to look at whether it's homelessness or um 
uh, you know, or, 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 or a museum, which is a nonprofit that has to have some sort of social innovation mission. You know, you have all types of folks that are trying to, to do good. Government is also looking in into, you know, interesting social innovation opportunities. And so um, I've, uh, I've found a couple clients that, that were more on that end, uh, that were really not even veteran related or, or very lightly uh, veteran related and, and more just into sort of, hey, what, what do we do to think differently about this societal issue that we're dealing with or, or to help um, solve some of our community's major challenges? And, and we'll, work, we'll work with them to, to try to figure that out as well. So I, I'm taking hopefully all my experience um, and, and, and plugging it into different aspects of, of what I could do in my entrepreneurial consulting venture. The problem is, of course, explaining that in just a couple words. Uh, thank God we have a, uh, a few more minutes on this podcast. So when you meet somebody <laughs> on an airplane, they're like, what do you do for a living? It's just like, uh, well, how much yeah, time do you have? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, we as veterans, uh, being less than one percenters, we, we just assume everybody else gets us and understand what it's all about. But the fact is they don't. And like corporate America has tried to do the right thing by hiring veterans, but so many corporations, they try it and like, okay, this isn't working. What's going on here? Some of them have just written off the veteran community because it didn't work. Other ones start looking around asking questions like, what's going on? Why is it not working? Right. Um, for example, I was talking, uh, a, a fellow Cobra pilot, Marine buddy of mine, uh, tour in New York, who works for bank of America. He's heavily involved in some of their veteran hiring. And somebody, somebody from another company was talking to him about how, do you, you know, we need to talk about what kind of program we can set up to help hire veterans because you guys seem to be doing a pretty good job. And he, 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 you know, he looks at me, he says, well, you already have one of the best assets you could have as far as hiring veterans. And they're like, what do you, huh? What do you mean? And he says, well, go get all the veterans that, you, that are already working for you, bring them together and use them. Right. And, and and they'd never yeah. even they never even thought of that. Like, oh, I didn't even think of that. You know, it's some, sometimes something so simple. Somebody you know from the outside looking in, who can come in, poke their head around, and say, look, if you realign this and change this, um, you know, it can change things dramatically. I, I know of another example, uh, Center for Transitional Leadership. I, I serve on the board of directors for that with Bob Ulan, and Bob got a uh, an Army Colonel a job down at Coke Industries. Which is a really huge, uh, you know, phenomenal company. They hired this guy to be head of their HR department because, like, if we're going to hire veterans, we need somebody that can speak veteran. And so they put they put a guy in charge that's a veteran, and he's came. He's you know, broad based career, uh, you know, twenty five plus year career in the army. He's got a he's probably had to deal with human resources and that kind of issue and hiring and firing, so to speak, the military version of it. And it's it's done phenomenal. I mean, they've last I heard they've hired, you know, something like four or five hundred veterans since he took over there. And uh, so companies are getting it, but a lot of companies are looking for help, uh, yeah. and that creates opportunity, you know, for guys like you that can explain it to them. Well, and and I think that it's 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 even more complicated than that. You know, everything you said is right, but the the question is then once we get to once we get to this point where, okay, we've established this veteran affinity group or we've hired, you know, a, a retired army officer to, to help our veteran hiring efforts. And, and, you know, I can name literally dozens of companies that have done those two things. The question is, how does that permeate into the company culture? And so a lot of times what you'll see is, is they're like, okay, great. We got our veteran affinity group. And it's kind of like the, the kids table at Thanksgiving. The veterans all gather every third Wednesday in the, you know, the, the, the table at the west end of the cafeteria and they talk to each other. Yay, we're good. The veterans are good. They're happy. They're talking to each other. They're satisfied. <laughs> now we're going to go do our thing. And that, that's not the way to do it. And I think that the veterans contribute to that as well because they'll try to make their veteran affinity groups exclusive. Like, you know, this is just for us. You know, no one understands us. You know, that's, that's why they gave us a special group and the special table because no one understands us. And, I, <laughs> and I, I'm being a little bit. <laughs> this is the I'm island like, of misfit toys. Get out of here. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's true, and, and and I think that sometimes a lot of veterans buy into that narrative, um, and and you know, not to not to sort of um, uh, get into the numbers on it, but but you mentioned that that number we hear a lot about the the one percenters, um, and 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 that's that doesn't apply to veterans at all. Um, you know, one around one percent of of our country's on active duty in the military, but it's about nine percent of our country has served in the military. Right, nine mm -hmm. percent of of adult Americans have served in the military, and if you expand that. To the people who have, um, we'll say, lived in a house with a veteran or a military member, 
So you're talking about kids, you're talking about spouses, you may even be talking about uh, some parents and things like that. You can you get up into the 50, 60 million person range of people who have what you should think is a, a, a decent understanding of what it, what it means to serve in the military um, and, and because they've watched their father do it or their, or their, or their um, spouse do it. Um, or they've done it themselves, and um, uh, and and of course their father or their mother, I should clarify. Um, and and what you get then is you get okay, we got sixty million people. Um, the problem is that that's still only you know about one in five, twenty twenty percent or so. Um, and and so it's still it's still f- not very many. It's enough that we need to educate the other eighty percent. But it's not this woe is me one percent ninety nine don't understand me. And I think that we as veterans, when we throw out um, some of the data and try to make it sound extreme, we're actually pigeonholing ourselves into this place of like, wow, veterans are having a hard time transitioning. And and yeah, there's certainly veterans who are having a hard time transitioning. They exist. There's lots of veterans who aren't having a hard time transitioning, you know, and so um, sort of sort of understanding what the entire landscape looks like and, and understanding how many people can um, uh, really contribute to it is really important and being a- inclusive, right? So uh, the... Um, one of the best examples, I think, is uh, is Starbucks. It's a company that I've worked with a little bit um, on both sides, uh, sort of, of my experience. Um, and their their veteran programs, of course, are all driven by Howard Schultz, um, who's not a veteran or has any relationship to veterans, but has been inspired by many veterans and wrote a book about it. Um, but the initial programs were run by a woman who wasn't a veteran, um, but whose father had served. And she found that that was a really, it gave her a little bit of insight, maybe not as much as she had served, but but it, it really gave her the opportunity um, to be open and to explore, to find veterans in the company, like you said, to bring them along. But she really embraced that role because she felt she had a role as as the child of a veteran. Um, and and if you can be exclusive first, to, inclusive, excuse me, first to those people, and then to the people who have no idea, then we're really creating this culture. And that that culture could be in a company, it could be in a community, it could be in a school. Uh, you know, and uh, and you're creating this culture where everybody values that military service uh, that was done by um, a small group w- within this subset of folks, and and I think that's really important. Uh, way, way, way easier said than done because we've done so much to k- take the culture in the other direction as well. Um, and I think that entrepreneurs are going to see this too. Not just like when you know you're you're kind of taking your resume in for a conventional job and you get stonewalled because someone doesn't understand what you know, what, what specialty you had when you were on that Navy ship. Um, I don't even understand that because I was in the army. Uh, and so, <laughs> so we, we suffer from that too. Um, but I know entrepreneurs are going to see that too. And when, when, especially if they're trying to market themselves, um, you know, whatever they're doing, their military service probably contributes to their ability to, to lead and to succeed, uh, and to be entrepreneurs. And, and, and so I think that the more we can, collectively work to sort of change this culture the 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 more fertile landscape we're all going to have as job seekers or entrepreneurs or just community members uh to be successful in our own lives in our own communities well hey chris we're getting close to the end of our time actually we've gone over i i don't know what's going on but i'm going on a streak here of of going over on my time i try to keep it under 30 minutes and we go past it because things just get so get so good but uh um i do want to ask so now that you've become an entrepreneur, you know what's that like? Sometimes I ask the way I ask it is: would, Do you consider yourself unemployable? Do I consider myself unemployable? As, as, in, as in, could you imagine yourself having to go back to work for for somebody? Oh, oh, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, you've yeah, got the I, taste of entrepreneurship now. Yeah, yeah. Could you go back to the job? I mean. You know, for me, the priority is uh, is always the family. Um, you know, I have two young daughters and, and, and my wife, and, and, and she works and does really well in her job. Uh, and in fact, we recently moved for her job. One of the benefits of me being an, an entrepreneur and having my own business was that I could move with with us. I could do I could do my job from anywhere. Right. I had clients on the east and west coast and all over the place. And so when we moved, um, you, we only had to switch one job that was hers, and I kept mine, which was great. Um, but no, so I do it for them, right? I do it for the family. Um, and what that means is that um, they would drive me back to the the job as well, a, a conventional job, um, and, and and out of the entrepreneurial stuff if necessary. As long as I can keep this viable, this is what I want to do. I love it. I would go back for them, but but by choice, 
I mean, it'd have to be a heck of a good job with <laughs> a heck of a good opportunity because because the ability to, to you know to work my work work with people I like on projects that I'm interested in um, is 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 probably the best job description I've ever heard. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's you know it's just a matter of time I think um, uh, before I either become you know quite successful and to try, I feel like I'm still in that in that place. I'm at that I'm I'm doing this for about a year and a half. And I'm still in that place where uh, I'm either going to figure out that I can do this for a really, really, really long time, or that I have to go back. And but it, yeah, you to answer your question, yeah, I, I I prefer not to. I prefer to stay out here on my own and, and doing my thing. So this is this absolutely is great. okay. Well, hey, uh, what one last thing? Um, if if somebody wants to check out your business, it is uh, MarvinStrategies.com, just like it sounds. And uh, so go go check out Chris. And uh, one last thing, I wanted to get in there before before uh, things get too cha- chaotic there at the at the household. Um, do you? Uh, what would you say to that veteran out there that's looking to go into entrepreneurship? Thinks they may want to go that route, but not really sure about themselves. You know, probably something different than most people say. I think the first thing is that you need to be sure about yourself, and 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 that sounds that sounds ironic given what you just described, but but. If you're if you don't have the confidence that you can do something, that's going to come out when you're trying to pitch yourself. I mm-hmm. mean, that's you're, you're pitching yourself, you're pitching your ideas, you're pitching your company, um, whatever product you might have or service you might provide. And and um, if you're not confident that you know this is what your client or your customer needs, not just once or thinks it's a good idea, um, then uh, then you're not going to have that. I don't think you're going to find success because if you don't believe in yourself, they're not going to, why would anybody, why would you ask other people to believe in you? Um, so the one, on the one side, I would say, you know, lean on that veteran experience and know that, you know, you've done some pretty amazing stuff and you have this great education, um, that was subsidized by the taxpayer, right? Like this, this, this education in, in leadership and problem solving and team building that was, that was subsidized by each one of our community members and taxpayers and, and, and what you got out of the military, that will go into what you're building uh, and what you're doing and, and, and talk about that. Um, and at the same time, don't think that anybody's going to give you something just because you're a veteran. Because at the end of the day, especially if you're competing, uh, you know, if you have a brand new product, nobody cares if that product is made by a veteran or not a veteran. They care if that product works, right? They care if that product oh, yeah. benefits them. And so don't think that you're going to be given anything um, because you're a veteran. And, and so while, while you can lean on the skills that you've gotten there, do not lean on any type of entitlement that you think you have because you are competing now against everybody out there. And, and you may go to, uh, to, to, to a room full of veteran entrepreneurs and have the best idea, but that doesn't determine success. You need to go to a room full of entrepreneurs. It goes back to what I told somebody, and maybe this is a good place to end. To, I told somebody once, um, somebody told me they were building um, a, a, a computer platform, a, you know, a technology platform that would, be, would, would become the LinkedIn for veterans. And isn't that wonderful? And all these veterans can go on LinkedIn, on, the, on this LinkedIn for veterans, and they can um, have – have connections with other veterans and get jobs and this and that. And, and I said, that's, just, that's great. And the technology sounds really sound. And I really applaud your, you know, the, the idea that you have, but, but, but one of the um, problems with what your, what your idea is that we already have that we have a LinkedIn for veterans. It's called LinkedIn. And if veterans, <laughs> and if veterans aren't on LinkedIn and if they're not having conversations with non-veterans and working with, you know, non-veterans, and if entrepreneurs aren't pitching, you know, pitching themselves to non-veteran customers and clients and and mentors, et cetera, et cetera, um, then then they're never gonna they're never gonna succeed. So so to the degree that we want to cloister ourselves, that's a negative for all of us. Uh, it's yeah. about, it's you know called reintegration for a reason, but um, but whatever way you choose to do it, make sure you're doing it. Sounds being, like you're talking about Rally Point. Um, I might be. <laughs> I, I'm on Rally Point. I you know I'm not saying one way or another I don't even know how good they're doing but I know what you're talking about so yeah. Um, but yeah I, I, I love LinkedIn because link, LinkedIn is all business no BS and that's right so uh, you know good shout out for LinkedIn definitely um, well hey man let's wrap this up uh, we could probably talk for a couple more hours um, like I said I'm on a streak of like interviews that just want to go on and on and on so I try to trying to keep it under under commute average commute length but uh, sometimes <laughs> we go over so wow. anyways, um, well, thanks, Chris. Sage advice. Uh, thanks for sharing your story. Um, glad you've made it through your struggles and, and recovered um, from your 
helicopter crash. I'd like to hear the details, the rest of this story, uh, some other time. So we'll have to, sure, uh, we'll have to chat again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks right, for the time. I really appreciate being on. Yep. You bet. All right. These two veterans are Oscar Mike. As you can tell from listening to the veteran on the move podcast, interviews are a great way to tell your story and spread the word about your business. If you would like to get booked as a podcast guest, I recommend interview valet. You can check out Interview Valet at veteranonthemove.com slash valet. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time, this veteran is 